Hello and welcome back to our novel study of the Phantom Tollbooth. This is chapter 17, Unwelcoming Committee. You know that the prefix un means not, so this is not welcoming. And a committee is a group of people that is appointed for a specific function. Spoiler alert, we're going to meet three demons. And you've actually already met one. No, it was not the ever-present word snatcher. Remember, he's not a demon. But we did meet a well-dressed man with no face who very politely asked Milo, Tok, and the Humbug to do some tasks for him. And Milo had to take the grains of sand from one pile with a pair of tweezers and create another pile right next to it. And Tok had to take an eyedropper and take out the water from a well one drop at a time and fill another well right next to it. And the humbug had to take a needle and dig a giant hole into the side of a mountain. And that's where we left off. Now, when we meet each demon, we're going to pause and we're going to discuss the main ideas, the themes, and the vocabulary associated with each demon so that you know what to study for the quiz. But before we begin the chapter, it's important to know what are we talking about when we say demon? Now, in the book, of course, the demons are going to be literal creatures. But in our world, we don't actually have literal demons, but we do have something that people like to call inner demons. I like to call them negative character traits. All characters in books and movies and television have positive character traits and negative character traits. Well, of course, in the real world, people do too. You have negative character traits and, of course, you have positive character traits. I also have my own negative character traits. Well, that's what these demons actually are. They are what we call metaphors. Take a look at definition number two, because that's the one that's important here. A thing regarded as representative or symbolic of something else, especially something abstract. So these demons that are real in the book are not real in our world, but they are real as ideas, specifically ways that we think or behave. These demons for us are symbols or metaphors of negative character traits that we have in our own lives. And believe you me, we all have them. You might have one of these demons, or you might have more than one. I hope you do not have all of them. We call these inner demons because they're invisible, they're psychological, and they're habitual, meaning they're things that we do all the time. And why are they called demons? Well, because they are thoughts, behaviors, or actions that keep us from learning and maturing. They prevent us from growing physically healthy, mentally wise, emotionally fit, and spiritually centered. So Milo had these traits in the beginning of the book, and now he's going to have to literally face his inner demons. And as he does, we will as well. Because when we come across a demon, I would like you to pay careful attention to the details and ask yourself, is this one of my inner demons? Is this something that prevents me from learning and growing and being the best human being that I could possibly be? And we'll see how Milo deals with facing his own inner demons. Okay, one more final thing before we start the chapter, and that is adverbs. Yes, the part of speech that is a word which describes an action, or as I like to say, how a thing does something. Adverbs are very easy to spot because they have an L-Y at the end of them, and I'm pointing this out even though we've already covered it because there are a lot of adverbs in this chapter, I noticed. So pay attention when you come across one. If you don't know what the adverb means, look at the screen and check the definition. All right, let's pick up where we left off with Milo, Tok, and the Humbug doing these tasks for the man with no face. Chapter 17 unwelcoming committee. The humbug whistled gaily at his work, for he was never as happy as when he had a job which required no thinking at all. After what seemed like days, 
he had dug a hole scarcely large enough for his thumb. Tok shuffled steadily back and forth with the dropper in his teeth, but the full well was still almost as full as when he began, and Milo's new pile of sand was hardly a pile at all. How very strange, said Milo, without stopping for a moment. I've been working steadily all this time, and I don't feel the slightest bit tired or hungry. I could go right on the same way forever. Perhaps you will, the man agreed with a yawn. At least, it sounded like a yawn. Well, I wish I knew how long it was going to take, Milo whispered as the dog went by again. Why not use your magic staff and find out, replied Tok as clearly as anyone could with an eyedropper in his mouth. Milo took the shiny pencil from his pocket and quickly calculated that, at the rate they were working, it would take each of them 837 years to finish. Pardon me, he said, tugging at the man's sleeve and holding the sheet of figures up for him to see, but it's going to take 837 years to do these jobs. Is that so? replied the man, without even turning around. Well, you'd better get on with it then. But it hardly seems worthwhile, said Milo softly. Worthwhile, the man roared indignantly. All I meant was that perhaps it isn't too important, Milo repeated, trying not to be impolite. Of course it's not important. He snarled angrily. I wouldn't have asked you to do it if I thought it was important. And now, as he turned to face them, he didn't seem quite so pleasant. Then why bother? asked Tok, whose alarm suddenly began to ring. Because, my young friends, he muttered sourly, what could be more important than doing unimportant things? If you stop to do enough of them, you'll never get to where you're going. He punctuated his last remark with a villainous laugh. <laughs> then you must, gasped Milo. Quite correct, he shrieked triumphantly. I am the terrible trivial demon of petty tasks and worthless jobs, ogre of wasted effort, and monster of habit. The humbug dropped his needle and stared in disbelief while Milo and Tok began to back away slowly. Don't try to leave, he ordered with a menacing sweep of his arm, for there's so very much to do. And you still have over 800 years to go on the first job. But why do only unimportant things? Asked Milo, who suddenly remembered how much time he spent each day doing them. Think of the trouble it saves, the man explained, and his face looked as if he'd be grinning an evil grin, if he could grin at all. If you only do the easy, and useless jobs, you'll never have to worry about the important ones which are so difficult. You just won't have the time, for there's always something to do to keep you from what you really should be doing. And if it weren't for that dreadful magic staff, you'd never know how much time you were wasting. As he spoke, he tiptoed slowly toward them with his arms outstretched, and continued to whisper in a soft, deceitful voice. Now, do come and stay with me. We'll have so much fun together. There are things to fill and things to empty, things to take away and things to bring back, things to pick up and things to put down. And besides all that, we have pencils to sharpen, holes to dig, nails to straighten, stamps to lick, and ever so much more. Why, if you stay here, you'll never have to think again. And with a little practice, you can become a monster of habit too. 
they were all transfixed by the trivium's soothing voice. But just as he was about to clutch them in his well-manicured fingers, a voice cried out, Run! Run! Milo, who thought it was Tuck, turned suddenly and dashed up the trail. Run! Run! It shouted again, and this time Tuck thought it was Milo and quickly followed him. Run! Run! It urged once more, and now the humbug, not caring who said it, ran desperately after his two friends with the terrible trivium close behind. That's right. Take a pause. Okay, here's what you need to know about the terrible trivium. First of all, let's look at the word trivium, which comes from the word trivial, which means of very little importance or value, unnecessary or insignificant. And if you look at the U-M at the end of trivium, that tells you it's a Latin word because only Latin words end in U-M. So let's look at the characteristics of the terrible trivium. He is an elegant man with no face, dressed in a fine suit and hat. But what's more important is that he flatters Milo Talk and Humbug into doing meaningless, or what we would say, trivial tasks. He's actually sinister and threatening, and he is a monster of habit. Now, the idiom that is commonly used is a creature of habit, which just means someone who always wants to do the same thing in the same way. And I told you in the last chapter that every demon has a lesson and, or a theme associated with it, and the Terrible Trivium's lesson is don't waste time on meaningless activities in order to put off or procrastinate on what you should be doing. This is a very common inner demon. And procrastination is one of my personal inner demons, and I think you understand what this is all about. It's when you have something important to do, but you don't want to do it, and you avoid doing it by giving yourself other little things to do that are definitely not as important as that important thing that you have to do. And the terrible trivium, again, is a metaphor for wasting time on trivial tasks and not doing the unimportant ones. So just make sure that you remember the important details about the three jobs that the characters had to do, and most important, that Milo uses one of his gifts, the magic pencil staff from the Math Magician, to calculate how long it was going to take to do all of these trivial tasks. And when he actually uses his brain to figure out that it's going to take that long, he realizes it's a waste of time, and that's what allows him to escape the terrible trivium. But a small voice was shouting, run, run. So let's find out what that voice is and where they are running to. Run, run. It urged once more, and now the humbug, not caring who said it, ran desperately after his two friends with the terrible trivium close behind. This way, this way, the voice called again. They turned in its direction and scrambled up the difficult slippery rocks, sliding back at each step almost as far as they'd gone forward. With a great effort and many helping paws from Tok, they reached the top of the ridge at last, but only two steps ahead of the furious trivium. Over here, over here, advised the voice, and without a moment's hesitation, they started through a puddle of sticky ooze, which quickly became ankle deep, then knee deep, then hip deep, until finally they were struggling along through what felt very much like a waist deep pool of peanut butter. The trivium, who had discovered a mound of pebbles which needed counting, followed no more, but stood at the edge, shaking his fist, shouting horrible threats, and promising to rouse every demon in the mountains. <sighs> what a nasty fellow, gasped Milo, who was having great difficulty just getting his legs to move. I hope I never meet him again. I believe he stopped chasing us, said the bug, looking back over his shoulder. It's not what's behind that worries me remarked Tok as they stepped from the sticky mess. But what's ahead? 
Keep going straight. Keep going straight, counseled the voice as they continued to pick their way carefully along the new path. Now, step up, step up, it recommended, and almost before they knew what had happened, they had all taken a step up and then plunged to the bottom of a deep, murky pit. But he said, up, Milo complained bitterly from where he lay sprawling. Well, I hope you didn't expect to get anywhere by listening to me, said the voice gleefully. We'll never get out of here, the humbug moaned, looking at the steep, smooth sides of the pit. That is quite an accurate evaluation of the situation, said the voice coldly. Then why did you help us at all? shouted Milo angrily. Oh, I'd do as much for anybody, he replied. Bad advice is my specialty, for, as you can plainly see, I'm the long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-haired, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, big-footed monster. And, if I do say so myself, one of the most frightening fiends in this whole wild wilderness. With me here, you wouldn't dare try to escape. And with that, he shuffled to the edge of the pit and leered down at his helpless prisoners. Tok and the humbug turned away in fright, but Milo, who had learned by now that people are not always what they say they are, reached for his telescope and took a long look for himself. And there, at the rim of the hole, instead of what he'd expected, stood a small furry creature with very worried eyes and a rather sheepish grin. Why, you're not long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-haired, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, or big-footed, and you're not at all frightening, said Milo indignantly. What kind of a demon are you? The little creature, who seemed stunned at being found out, leaped back out of sight and began to whimper softly. I'm the demon of insincerity, he sobbed. I don't mean what I say. I don't mean what I do. And I don't mean what I am. Most people who believe what I tell them go the wrong way and stay there. But you and your awful telescope have spoiled everything. I'm going home. And, crying hysterically, he stamped off in a huff. It certainly pays to have a good look at things, observed Milo as he wrapped up the telescope with great care. Now all we have to do is climb out, said Tok, placing his front paws as high on the wall as he could. Here, hop up on my back. Milo climbed onto the dog's shoulders. Then the bug crawled up both of them and, by standing on Milo's head, just managed to hook his cane on the root of an old gnarled tree. With loud complaints, he hung on doggedly until the other two had climbed out over him and pulled him up, somewhat dazed and discouraged. I'll lead the way for a while, he said, brushing himself off. Follow me and We'll stay out of trouble. Okay, take a pause. The demon of insincerity. Well, to be sincere means to express one's true feelings, to not be dishonest or hypocritical. It means being honest about who you are and how you feel. And when you speak to people, being honest in what you say to them. Being insincere, with the prefix I-N meaning not, is when you are not expressing your genuine feelings. It's when you're saying something that you don't really mean. And the characteristics of the demon of insincerity are that he describes himself as a monster, but he's actually just a small furry creature. And he's not a threat at all. He does not mean what he says, and he gives bad advice. The lessons associated with the demon of insincerity are that you should be sincere in your thought and in your action. Be honest with others and have personal integrity, which is one of my favorite words.
Milo says it pays to have a good look at things, which he learned from Alec Bings. The lesson there is observe people carefully. They may be hiding their true intentions or motives. Don't just believe everything that you're told right off the bat. Try to observe if somebody is being insincere before following their advice. I'll lead the way for a while, he said, brushing himself off. Follow me and we'll stay out of trouble. He guided them along one of five narrow ledges, all of which led to a grooved and rutted plateau. They stopped for a moment to rest and make plans, but before they had done either, the whole mountain trembled violently and, with a sudden lurch, rose high into the air, carrying them along with it, for, quite accidentally, they had stepped into the calloused hand of the gelatinous giant. And what have we here? He roared, looking curiously at the tiny figures huddled in his palm and licking his lips. He was an incredible size, even sitting down, with long, unkempt hair, bulging eyes, and a shape hardly worth speaking of. He looked, in fact, very much like a colossal bowl of jelly, without the bowl. How dare you disturb my nap, he bellowed furiously, and the force of his hot breath tumbled them over in his hand. We're terribly sorry, said Milo meekly, when he'd untangled himself, but you looked just like part of the mountain. Naturally, the giant replied in a more normal voice, but even this was like an explosion. I have no shape of my own, so I try to be just like whatever I'm near. In the mountains, I'm a lofty peak, and on the beach, a broad sandbar. In the forest, a towering oak, and sometimes in the city, I'm a very handsome 12-story apartment house. I just hate to be conspicuous. It's really not safe, you know? Then he looked at them again with hungry eyes and wondered how well they'd taste. You look much too big to be afraid of anything, said Milo quickly, for the giant had already begun to open his mouth wide. I'm not he said with a slight shiver that ran all over his gelatinous body. I'm afraid of everything. That's why I'm so ferocious. If the others found out, I'd just die. Now, do be quiet while I eat my breakfast. He raised his hand toward his gaping mouth, and the humbug shut his eyes tightly and clasped both hands over his head. Then... Aren't you really a fearful demon? Milo asked desperately, on the assumption that the giant had been brought up well enough not to talk with a mouthful. Well, approximately, yes, he replied, lowering his arm to the vast relief of the bug. That is, comparatively, no. What I mean is, relatively, maybe. In other words, roughly, perhaps. What does everyone else think? There, you see, he said peevishly, I'm even afraid to make a positive statement. So please stop asking questions before I lose my appetite altogether. Then he raised his arm again and prepared to swallow the three of them in one gulp. Well, why don't you help us rescue Rhyme and Reason? Then maybe things will get better, shouted Milo again. This time almost too late, for in another instant they would have all been gone. Oh, I wouldn't do that, said the giant thoughtfully, lowering his arm once more. I mean, why not leave well enough alone? That is, it'll never work. I wouldn't take a chance. In other words, let's keep things as they are. Changes are so frightening. As he spoke, he began to look a bit ill. Maybe I'll just eat one of you. 
he remarked unhappily, and save the rest for later. I don't feel very well. I have a better idea, said Milo. You do, interrupted the giant, losing any desire to eat at all. If it's one thing I can't swallow, it's ideas. They're so hard to digest. I have a box full of all of the ideas in the world, said Milo, proudly holding up the gift King Azaz had given him. The thought of it terrified the giant, who began to shake like an enormous pudding. Put me down and don't go away, he pleaded, forgetting for a moment who had hold of whom. And please, don't open that box. In another moment, he'd set them down on the next jagged peak and, with panic in his eyes, lumbered off to warn the others of this terrible new threat. But news travels quickly. The word snatcher, the trivium, and the long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-haired, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, big-footed monster had already spread the alarm throughout the evil, unenlightened mountains. And out the demons came, from every cave and crevice, through every fissure and crack, from under the rocks and up from the mud, stomping and shuffling, slithering and sliding, through the murky shadows, and all had only one thought in mind, destroy the intruders and protect ignorance. From where they stood, Milo Tok and the humbug could see them moving steadily forward, still far away, but coming quickly. On all sides, the cliffs were alive with this evil collection of crawling, looming, creeping, lurching shapes. Some could be seen plainly, others were but dim silhouettes, and yet still more, only now beginning to stir from their foul places, would be along much sooner than they were wanted. We better hurry, barked Tok, or they're sure to catch us, and he started up the trail again. Milo took one deep breath and did the same, and the bug, now that he knew what lay behind, ran ahead with renewed enthusiasm. Okay, the gelatinous giant. Gelatinous means having the nature of or resembling jelly, jelly-like. So he is this giant jelly-like demon, and here are his characteristics. He tries to be like whatever he's near. He hates to be conspicuous. He hates to stand out. And there's another word for that. We call that conforming. So he likes to take the shape or the color of whatever he's near because he doesn't like to be noticed. He's self-conscious. And that is an inner demon. Being self-conscious or embarrassed or being afraid to be ourselves, to be unique, can hold us back from some tremendous personal growth. He's also afraid to try new things, take chances, and make decisions. He's peevish, which means easily annoyed at little things. And he has what we call negative self-talk. That's when you, in your mind, say bad things about your own self. It's like you're putting yourself down. And we all do it from time to time. Some of us do it a little more often than we really should be doing. And if you do it all the time, for a long time, it can be really psychologically damaging. So let's look at some of the actual things he said that we would consider to be negative self-talk. Leave well enough alone, which means if it's good enough, then don't mess with it, don't try to improve it, just leave it the way it is. It'll never work. That's what we call a defeatist attitude. If you believe it's not gonna work, then it's probably not gonna work. And change is frightening. Change can be difficult, but it doesn't have to be frightening. Change is necessary for growth. Change is the only constant in this universe. So change can be exciting. And without change, we would be extremely bored. The lessons of the gelatinous giant are be yourself. Don't try to be somebody that you're not. Don't conform in order to be liked. Conform means to try and be like everybody else. If you don't like a band, or a certain food, or a style of dress, 
then don't pretend to like that band and don't pretend to like that food and don't wear those clothes just because everybody else is doing it and you want to be liked. We should be not afraid to try new things, take chances, and meet new people. Because oftentimes in life, the most wonderful opportunities that life has to offer us only come when we take risks and chances and meet new people or go somewhere we've never been before. It's okay to be different. It's okay if you have weird little traits about yourself. Celebrate those differences, and especially when you meet somebody else that is very different from you, either in their culture, their customs, their beliefs, or their habits. Celebrate those differences. Don't judge that person. We want to appreciate novelty, which is newness, and uniqueness in our lives. We want to take our narrow bubble of experience, and we want to widen it to include as many possible different kinds of people, places, or experiences as we can. Because the more newness we accept into our lives, the more we learn and grow. Which is, of course, what the gelatinous giant does not want to do, and that's why he's a demon. The important detail here, of course, is that Milo uses the box of words that he received from King Azaz because the gelatinous giant is scared of new ideas. And he says two things in relation to that. He says that he can't swallow that, which is an idiom that means not interested in considering, thinking, or believing in something. And he also says... The important detail here is that Milo uses the box of words that he received from King Azaz because the gelatinous giant is scared of new ideas. So he said two things in relation to that. First thing he said was, I can't swallow that. Well, when we say that as an idiom, we mean that we're not interested in considering, thinking, or believing something. We just can't swallow that idea at all. And he also says that when he swallows those ideas, they're too hard to digest. Well, he means that literally, but we also mean that figuratively as an idiom, meaning that something that's hard to digest is hard to understand. The important detail here is that Milo uses the box of words that he received from King Azaz because the gelatinous giant is scared of new ideas. That's it for the three demons in this chapter. I'll see you in chapter 18, and I think you know what it's called. I'm excited. I hope you are too.